Miranda, are we on? Um, yes, I will. We'll start right. shortly. Well, welcome everybody and uh, welcome on behalf of FSA in North Dakota. Uh, my name is Brad Tickerson. I'm the State Executive Director here at the State Office in Fargo. I apologize for my voice. I've been entertaining and probably not wearing my gloves and caps outside and, and, and getting, a, getting a good old fashioned North Dakota cold. Um, this webinar is, is designed to help uh, producers across the state, whether you're a grain farmer or, or a livestock producer, in order to find out the programs that are available to you through FSA. We've had a challenging year in 2019, and that's not, that's not taken lightly by anybody. No script has been written, so I think a lot of these things that we do will need a lot of patience on behalf of the producer and on, on behalf of the uh, employees in order to get these programs implemented in a timely fashion. The thing is that you have to remember that it might not happen as fast as you want, but the thing is, is that we're here to help you. And we want to make sure that we give you all the cards in the playing deck, that we give you all the options, and that you at the end make the final decision as far as what, what avenue you want to take. The other thing I need to remind everybody is, is that this is not going to be a quick fix. 2019 is going to set up some hangover effects that's going to last for four or five years. Lisa will talk about emergency loans. We'll talk about different programs. We'll talk about WIP Plus. WIP Plus is a long process. It's going to take time. We're going to take settlements from RMA. We're going to use that data. We're going to go through all these steps and getting these monies out to the producers isn't going to be tomorrow. It's going to be down the road. EM loans are probably going to be amortized out over five, seven years. It's going to take some time. But we've done this before. We're North Dakotans and we know that times are tough and that we got to you know hunker in and we got to take and take the take as many steps as we can in order to be around for the next year, for the next five, 10 years. So with that being said, I just wanna make sure that everybody um, pays attention to this webinar. I hear it's getting recorded. So if you don't catch it the first time, please replay it again. And uh, it's great to be doing outreach through technology. And hopefully we uh, have a break from other nature. We get an uptick in prices and then we can get back to doing what we do best in North Dakota, raising crops and making money and, and making these farms Farm sustainable. So, thanks for your attendance today. And at this time, we'll turn it over to Lisa. Miranda. Thank you, Brad. Um, so, Miranda Meehan with NDSU Extension, and thank USDA FSA for coordinating with us to put on this webinar. Um, I know our extension agents across the state have been getting a lot of questions about specific programs, as I'm sure some of the local FSA offices. So, hopefully, this will provide some clarity on some of the questions um, that, that we'd be getting and also provide another point of contact for some more specific questions that may not be addressed. Um, I know we're getting some very specific questions that are situational and how those are addressed is gonna, is gonna vary on interpretation of that situation. Um, so just before we get started, I have a couple reminders. If you are not speaking, please be sure to mute your your mic and we will be holding all questions until the end. As Brad said, the, this is being recorded and will be posted on the NDSU Agriculture Disasters website and I will provide a link for that in the chat box for, for those of you to, if you want to come back and watch this at a later time. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Lisa Mean. And she is going to talk about emergency loan programs and loan servicing. Thank you, Miranda. Um, like Miranda said, my name is Lisa Many. I'm a farm loan specialist here at the Farm Service Agency. I'm working in the state office, and I will be presenting to you today uh, a couple different programs that we offer to our producers, uh, crop and livestock producers our emergency loan program, and then we'll also talk about disaster set aside for existing borrowers um, who need a payment uh, pushed to the tail end of their loan. So as you can see um, in the pictures that I had on the screen previously, when we talk about emergency loans, you know, it can be from a very uh, various sources of what caused that emergency. You can see we've got um, snow, a cow stuck in the snow. We had that happen in South Dakota a few years. We can see a bunch of combines that have fallen over due to tornadoes, uh, heavy snows causing, 
causing a roof to collapse on this barn. We also see flooding. This is a picture out of Iowa this year, a tornado that destroyed several bin, grain bins. And then of course, we've got some corn that's been impacted by drought. So we have various different means of uh, what would cons constitute emergency loan um, actions. So basically, just to talk about emergency loans, these are loans that are made to eligible applicants who have incurred a substantial financial loss from a disaster. And for our program purposes, a disaster is considered to be an event of unusual or adverse weather conditions or other natural phenomena that or quarantine that substantially affect the production of agricultural commodities by causing physical property or production losses. And we have a few different types of emergency loans and we'll break those down here as we go. So the, first, the first type of emergency loan would be what we call our production losses to commodities. Now this is a straight production loss due to um, rain events, uh, you know, like hail would count, drought, excessive rain, those types of things. So this is only impacting commodities. Again, it doesn't uh, talk about livestock. And to be eligible for this program, the producer would need to show a 30% yield reduction in their crops. And now if they have a multi-crop enterprise on their farm, as long as they are showing one crop that had a 30% loss, they would be eligible for a loan, an emergency loan on all the losses on all their crops, provided that all of the crops were essential to their operation. So the biggest thing here is that the producer needs to show a 30% loss. Now, normally when we talk about production losses to commodities, that's gonna be a lower yield or potentially no yield. And if there's no yield or a low yield, there's gonna be a lot less income coming into that farm to pay current bills. So usually the loan funds that are received from an emergency loan are going to be used to pay current bills. That may be your existing operating line of credit at the bank, if you had an operating line at FSA. We can also use those emergency funds to pay off um, current debt. <laughs> Excuse me. There's other uh, items that you can use the emergency loan funds for, but for the most part, we are using those funds to pay off current debt. We can also use those to replace lost working capital. An example of that would be if um, someone has savings account and in the interim of obtaining the emergency loan, they use the, their savings account balance, drain that down, they had used it to pay current bills, we could then replenish that working capital. In addition to that, we can also use the emergency funds to refinance farm-related debts. Again, that has to be other than real estate. And you can see there's uh, quite a few things that need to happen in order for that to refinance to work. And I won't go through everything. If you have um, questions about some of the eligibility or what the uses would be, we can certainly talk about that or you can um, pause and come back to the presentation but just know that we can use emergency funds to refinance farm-related debt as long as it's not real estate. Um, for our commodity loss emergency loans, we can do a loan term from one to seven years. We can also extend that up to 20 years if necessary so that we could obtain a feasible cash flow projection. And for security, FSA would want and will need a first lien um, in order to do that type of a loan. Okay, the second type of uh, emergency loan that we have would be real estate physical losses. So this is gonna be actual damage or destruction done to real estate. It does not include growing crops. So um, at the beginning, when we looked at those pictures, that would be, let's say that the roof of the barn collapsed. That would be an excellent example of uh, physical losses due to the disaster to real estate. So the use of those loan funds would be to repair or replace that property that was damaged or destroyed because of the disaster. We can also use the, uh, this type of emergency loan for any FO, farm ownership purpose, which means um, to purchase or to repair or can do construction on the farm site. 
We cannot use those funds to refinance a bridge loan. However, uh, we can use them to establish a new site for the farm dwelling. Let's say there was a tornado that came through and completely devastated the existing farm site. We could use the emergency loan funds to uh, potentially purchase a new farm site and make that the new operating headquarters. For the real estate physical loss loans, we can do a loan term up to 40 years, but that's dependent on the repayment ability of the producer, what their cash flow projections look like, and then what the useful life of the security is. And again, in this case, FSA would need a first lien on the real estate that is being pledged. In some cases, we can obtain a junior lien. And again, if people, folks had questions about that, you could certainly um, talk to us and we'll let you know that. And just as a reminder, the emergency loans made for losses to real estate are going to always be secured by the real estate that's purchased, repaired, or replaced, or improved with the emergency loan funds. The next type of emergency loan that we have is our chattel physical losses. And we break that down into what we call normal income security and then to our basic security. So again, it's chattel physical losses. When it comes to the normal income security, that would be where the livestock are gonna come in. The normal income security for livestock would be your calves, lambs, um, goat kids. Okay, so that's your market livestock, not any breeding livestock. Then when we have our chattel physical losses to the basic security, that's gonna talk about um, our, or be in, that would be for our breeding cows, which is the foundation livestock, uh, perennial crops that would be considered like an alfalfa field if that was destroyed and then also to any machinery and equipment. Uh, fruit and nut trees are included in this but we don't have a lot of those um, here in North Dakota so mostly we're concerned with the breeding livestock, machinery and equipment and then if we had any perennial crops. For these losses that loan term again is similar to the commodity losses we can do a term of one to seven years if we need to, we can also turn that out up to 20 years. And again, FSA would need a first lien on the property in order to do this type of emergency loan. So some of the uses, if we had a chattel physical loss to either the normal income security or the basic security, again, it, to me, it's common sense. We're gonna be using those emergency loan funds to replace or repair what was damaged due to that disaster. So. If we had a bunch of baby calves that were um, you know, frozen because of extremely cold and uh, snowy conditions, we could use those funds to either um, pay debts because again, we didn't have money from the sale of those calves. We could um, use the loan funds if we needed to buy back breeding livestock, if we needed to buy back replacement machinery and equipment. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things that would be eligible for this type of emergency loan. But that to me is the biggest thing that we're gonna to try to repair or replace or pay off debt associated with um, the loss. So producers, as far as eligibility, we can make emergency loans to farmers and ranchers who operate or own the land in the county that's declared either a presidential major disaster if we have a uh, secretarial disaster designation, if the FSA, Farm Service Agency Administrator's physical loss notification is put out, or if we have a quarantine designation from the Deputy Administrator for farm programs, and then that would be issued through the State Executive Director. For the producer eligibility, they would need to meet all of FSA's general eligibility requirements. They have to be the owner operator of the farm. They cannot operate a non eligible enterprise. And what that is meaning is that we want that producer to be producing the commodities, producing the livestock. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, if they were just making, let's say, hay and selling all of the hay, their hay for a custom operation. We want them to be the producer and the owner. The um, applicant needs to be an established farmer. And then they also need to demonstrate that they are going to continue farming after we make them the emergency loan. In addition to that, uh, the producer must be unable to obtain
credit elsewhere, so they cannot obtain commercial credit at reasonable rates and terms from their local bank, local lender. Um, and then we've got quite a few other things as far as eligibility that we refer back to debt forgiveness. And the biggest thing to remember with any of our emergency loan programs is that FSA has to have the application no later than eight months from when the disaster was declared. That's a big uh, point in the eligibility is that we have to have that application within the eight months. And then again, we talked about for the commodity loans, they need to show a 30% loss on at least one crop. Um, in addition, we've got some more eligibility things. Um, another one to keep in mind is that the producer would not be able to receive duplicative government assistance. So if they received a crop insurance payment, we would then enter the amount of that crop insurance payment into our emergency loan calculator and they would then, um, that would reduce the amount of the emergency loan that they're eligible for. And that's because uh, federal crop insurance is RMA, that's part of the USDA. And so that would be considered duplicative government assistance. Um, we do uh, have a program with the emergency loans. If an applicant's primary enterprise is to breed, raise, and sell horses, they may be eligible for an emergency loan. Um, in the last few years, FSA has gone away from horses being an eligible enterprise. However, they are still eligible for our emergency loan program. And then emergency loans may not exceed the lesser of, um, well, the maximum that could be borrowed would be $500,000. <clears> Excuse me. And we can't, we won't, the, they cannot exceed the lesser of the amount of credit necessary to restore the operation to its pre-disaster condition. So we, if you only needed, let's say $200,000 to get back to the point where you were before the disaster, that is all that FSA would be able to uh, give you for the loan amount. Also for physical losses, we would only be able to uh, give you a loan for the total losses caused by the disaster. And then for the production losses to the commodities, like we talked about, we will be able to loan up to 100% of the total actual production loss. When we calculate losses for um, the production losses, only growing crops are considered a production loss and the applicant would use what we call form FSA 2309 and that is where they will report all their yields and their acreage information and then in addition to that if they did have any physical losses and then in our farm business plan program we um, use form 2311 which is in that farm business plan and that's where we enter in all of this information and it does the emergency loan calculations for us. Losses to the pasture and rangeland are calculated based on feed cost and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then quality losses are determined by comparing the average market price for the commodity at the grade that the applicant would normally have gotten for the product compared to what that grade is now due to say sprouting or something like that. So we would compare what they normally obtain for their uh, quality, let's say on wheat, compared to what they're obtaining on their wheat this year. And then the state executive director is the one that uh, sets the commodity prices that we use in our emergency loan calculations. Um, here is a chart that will show you um, kind of an if and then scenario on how the yields are calculated. And I won't go through this in detail. The easiest way to, uh, for FSA to do those calculations is if the producer keeps good records, if we can obtain crop insurance records from them. Um, if they don't have crop insurance, we have other options to try to obtain the information that is needed. So um, I will let you go through this slide on your own. 
continuing uh, for production losses to the native pasture. In this case, it's almost like comparing the quality loss. Uh, we are going to compare the cost of feed purchased per head in the disaster year compared to the average cost of feed that the producer purchased per head of livestock in the previous three years. So a few years ago when we had the uh, very serious drought in Western North Dakota, um, this was a perfect example of where a lot of our livestock producers would be eligible for the emergency loan program because they had uh, drought, pastures didn't have very much grass, and they had to do a significant amount of uh, feed purchase. And so then as long as they kept good records, we would be able to check and see what their feed costs were during that disaster time compared to what their three-year average feed cost was. Calculating losses for the physical losses. Again, those will be costs that are associated with repairing or replacing chattels or uh, essential property to the farm. Again, the value of the replacement livestock, if we had to purchase new cows to replace a bunch of cows that froze, um, we need the applicant to provide information to FSA on what their livestock inventory was for the last three years. And then we can get a really good idea of where they stand. And then also if they had, let's say, a perennial crop disaster, say to their alfalfa, then we would need to know what the costs would be to restore that. So what are, do we need to put any fertilizer down? Um, what would this, any um, seed treatments, purchase of seed, the, you know, if they needed to custom hire it, those kind of things, we would need to find out what the cost would be to replant that uh, alfalfa field. Our December interest rate for emergency loans is currently three and a half percent. Uh, this rate has not changed for a few months. Usually our rates uh, do change about an eighth or a quarter of a point each month. But like I said, the emergency loan rate has stayed steady at three and a half percent. And again, when we talk about our repayment schedule for the emergency loans, we're basing that on the useful life of the security and then uh, what the cash flow projections will allow for a payment and then the type of loss that the producer incurred. But at a minimum, the accrued interest has to be repaid each year on an emergency loan. We do have an exception to our security requirements for emergency loans. If adequate security, which would be one, what we would consider uh, a one-to-one -one value or 100% security to equal the loan amount, if that is not available, the Farm Service Agency can approve a loan based on um, the fact that the applicant pledged all of their other assets. We have a feasible cash flow plan, plan in place, and the applicant has had a positive net cash income in the last three out of five years. And then we would also obtain an assignment on all of their USDA program payments. When we're talking about um, assets that are damaged due to the disaster, we would need written documentation of any livestock inventories and records of pr product sales. And that would let FSA determine what values we had on that um, class of animal prior to the disaster. And then in addition to that, farm assets are gonna be valued as of the day before the disaster. So we're, um, you know, obviously going to give credit to the producer that, um, you know, a dead cow obviously is worth nothing. We would give them the value the day before the um, disaster happened. For our emergency loans, here's a couple links for the fact sheet. And then if anyone is interested in applying for an emergency loan, we've also put the link here for the application packet. Um, next, I'll talk about our disaster set-aside program. So this program is for borrowers that are um, existing FSA borrowers who are located in a designated disaster area or a contiguous county, which would be any county around their primary county. And they are not able to make their scheduled annual installment on their FSA debt. 
we here at the Farm Service Agency are authorized to consider a one-time uh, set aside of the payment to allow that operation to continue. The intent of disaster set aside is to relieve some of the immediate and temporary uh, financial stress caused by the disaster, uh, but we don't want to use the disaster set aside program to circumvent other loan servicing options that we do have at FSA. So with the disaster set aside, we would uh, base, again set aside that current payment that is due and it goes to the tail end of the loan and they would have that principal and interest amount due then when the loan fully matures. At FSA, we would notify our existing borrowers that the disaster set aside program is available. The first time that we have a designation, a disaster designation in a county that's been made by the president or the secretary of agriculture, FSA will send out a notice to our borrowers to let them know that we've had a disaster uh, declaration. We do not notify borrowers that are have non-program loans, uh, youth loans, or any borrower that's paying under a debt settlement agreement. How uh, to apply for disaster set aside. Again, we still work within that eight month window. So we would need applications received in the FSA office within eight months from when the disaster was declared. And then it's a very simple application process for the DSA. Um, we need a written request first and foremost. That could be uh, simply on a piece of tablet paper that says I, Farmer Joe, want to uh, request a disaster set aside of my installments at FSA, sign it and date it, and we would accept that. We can also accept, um, we have a form that we can mail out to folks if they're interested in applying and they could um, fill that out and that would work to request the DSA as well. Then we also need annual production that shows the income and expenses and the production for the year that the disaster occurred. So we would want, let's say for example, their 2019 year to date actuals showing income expenses and also all of the production of the farm, whether it's crops and or livestock. And then we would also need to obtain a projection for 2020. The producer could submit that to us and then we will work with them when we're processing this request to update their cash flow projection showing that they have a feasible plan for 2020. For borrowers to be eligible, they need to be operating in a farm in the disaster area. The disaster needs to be the reason that they are unable to pay their FSA installment uh, borrowers cannot have more than one set aside at a time. They cannot be considered to be a non-monetary default with FSA. And then they also need to be less than 165 days past due. If they're over 165 days, we would not be able to process or close the disaster set aside application. In addition to that, if we have a loan, an existing loan that has only two or fewer years remaining, we would not be able to do a disaster set aside on that loan. Uh, the borrower's loans cannot be accelerated. And again, once we complete the disaster set aside, the borrower has to be current on all of their loans at FSA. Um, they can't be restructured or uh, had primary loan servicing since the disaster, and we cannot set aside more than one year's annual installment or annual payment. Any existing borrower with a loan account that's on full or partial deferral cannot be considered for disaster set aside. Uh, full or partial deferral is when our existing borrowers have either one to five years where they're not making payments to FSA and instead are using uh, their income and their sales proceeds to pay other creditors during that one to five year period. And then once that deferral period is over, we're hoping that there will be more income generated and that the borrower would then again be able to pay FSA. And then if we have a borrower paying FSA debt under a bankruptcy plan, 
Um, this would all have to go through the court and they may be eligible for a disaster set aside. But again, it can be a lengthy process as it's going through um, the courts and has to be approved by the court. If you have any questions or would like more information, I've put together um, slides showing all of our county offices, where they are located, what city they're in, and then the telephone numbers. And here's the next slide that shows all of our offices. Again, if anyone has any questions, I believe uh, my contact information was listed on my first slide and might be listed later in the presentation. Um, you can certainly email me. Um, you can certainly call any of your county offices that have been listed or um, you, know, you can call me if you want and we can help you with any questions that you may have on either emergency loans or the disaster set aside program. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And then we're gonna be holding questions to, until the end as a reminder. And so our next speaker is gonna be Kristen Knudsen, and she is gonna be talking about the wildfires and hurricanes indemnity pro Program Plus, or better known as the WIP Plus program. All right, good afternoon, everyone. All right, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about the WIP Plus program. My name is Kristen Knudsen, and the WIP Plus program in uh, June of 2019, Congress passed the Disaster Relief Act of 2019, and this was a legislation that authorized the WIP Plus program for 2018 and 2019 disasters. A WIP Plus provides assistance for production losses to crops for producers, and crops that are intended for grazing are not eligible for WIP Plus. The qualifying disaster events for the WIP Plus program, the disasters had to have occurred between January 1st, 2018 and December 31st, 2019. So in North Dakota, there are four different qualifying disaster events. While the Disaster Relief Act authorized several different qualifying disaster events, only flooding, snowstorm, tornado, and wildfire are applicable to the state of North Dakota. So producers suffering production losses had to have occurred due to one of the qualifying disaster events. If all or part of the crop acreage suffered a loss due to one of those four qualifying disaster events, we would look at all acreage in that unit for that crop and all of the other eligible causes of loss for that acreage would be eligible for the WIP Plus program also. So in our example, we have a producer. Let's say this producer has two fields of corn and five acres of one field was flooded. So that is one of those four qualifying disaster events. That would make that crop and unit eligible for WIP Plus. And if that producer suffered a production loss due to hail, for instance, on another field of that corn during the coverage period, since that producer had at least part of the crop for that unit affected by the disaster event that qualified for WIP Plus, we would look at the production losses for all of those qualifying disaster events for the WIP Plus program. So we would include the production loss for the hail, the flooding, and the production from the unaffected acres for the WIP Plus program. So to be considered an eligible, eligible producer for WIP Plus, um, there are a couple different ways to become an eligible producer. Producers can be in a primary or secretarial presidential disaster county and they would automatically qualify for WIP Plus eligibility. However, if the producer is not in a primary county, they can still be eligible for WIP Plus. So all producers, whether they're in a primary designated county can qualify for WIP Plus regardless. So if the producer is qualifying for the qualifying disaster event that they're going to certify on their WIP Plus application is the same as the disaster event included in the primary designation, and the producer doesn't need to provide any other documentation to the county committee for their WIP Plus application. But if the qualifying disaster event that they're submitting to the county office on their WIP Plus application is different than the primary designation or their county didn't receive a primary designation, 
they would need to provide additional documentation to the county committee to be eligible for the WIP Plus program. So if you are a producer and you're not sure if your county was designated a primary county or not, or what qualifying disaster events you may have been designated for, you can certainly contact your local FSA office or there's a link included on this slide that lists all of the different FSA disaster designations. So if you are a producer that needs to provide documentation to the county committee for your WIP Plus application, um, the county committee may be asking for a producer statement with disaster details and dates, any photographs that you may have of the disaster event affecting the crop. If RMA has any documentation that they could provide to you, it would have been included with your notice of loss or loss adjustment on your crop. You could provide that to the county committee. Any sort of log of weather conditions or newspaper articles are also accepted as documentation for the county committee. So eligible producers for WIP Plus program, they include producers that took federal crop insurance coverage for their crop, producers that have NAP coverage on their crop, or producers that are uninsured. So a producer with any crop loss and has a production loss can apply for the WIP Plus program, regardless on what type of insurance you have. Eligibility will be determined for every producer based on the size of their loss and the level of insurance coverage elected by the producer. We apply what's called a WIP Plus factor, and there's a range of that factor that's determined based on the producer's coverage level or if they're uninsured. When we talk about calculating payments, payments are calculated on a crop by crop basis for all acreage within the pay group and unit. Okay, so not just the acreage affected by the eligible cause of loss will be on the WIP Plus application. We include production from all acreage for that crop on the WIP Plus application for that unit. So if you have multiple units, if you have um, federal crop insurance and you have multiple units, We'll look at basic units separately, and then we will include all the acreage together for enterprise unit structure for that crop. For 2018, WIP Plus applications that get approved by the county committee will be paid at 100% of the calculated payment. For 2019, WIP Plus applications, losses will be paid at 50% of the payment. And then after the end of the enrollment period, we will look at and see how much adequate funding there is available for the, for the uh, program remaining, and then we will issue more payments if that's applicable. <clears throat> at this time, as far as we know, all producers will receive 50% of their calculated payment. The WIP Plus program is not a first come first serve program. So when it comes to the specific WIP Plus calculation, we need to calculate the expected value of the crop by taking the acres times the price times the yield times any guarantee adjustment factor. So if the crop is insured through federal crop insurance, the acres that we use will be the lesser of the RMA or FSA reported acreage. The insured price is based on the RMA's insurance policy. And if the producer has a revenue policy, the price will be the higher of the harvest price or projected price. If the producer um, is an insured producer, the yield that we will use will come from the units yield provided by RMA. If you are a NAP or uninsured producer, the yield is the county expected yield for the crop established by the state committee, and the price is the price established by the state committee. So once we take the expected value of the crop, we take that times the WIP plus factor. And you'll see on the slide, there's a chart of WIP plus factors based on the coverage level that the producer has for the crop. Then we subtract out the actual value for the crop, subtract any salvage value, and subtract any applicable insurance indemnity that was paid, whether it was a federal crop insurance indemnity or a NAP payment that was issued to the producer. The WIP plus factor essentially increases the producer's coverage level for the crop. Therefore, if a producer did not receive an indemnity payment through crop insurance, we still encourage those producers to apply for the WIP plus program because they may be eligible for a WIP plus payment. 
If any acreage of the producers was unharvested, we will apply an unharvest factor to that acreage for the WIP Plus payment as well. And that is set by our state committee for the crop. So when we wanna talk about our WIP Plus payments, we also wanna mention about the payment limitations that are associated for this program with the Farm Service Agency. So the payment limitation for WIP Plus is $125,000 per person or entity for all three years, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Okay, so keep in mind that the legislation passed the disaster dates based on calendar year. So they began January 1, 2018 through December 31st of 2019. That's why all three crop years are listed because it includes all three crop years. If you're a producer and you have 75% of your income derived from farming, ranching, or forestry, you can have a payment limitation of $250,000 for each of the crop years, 2018, 19, and 20, with an overall payment limitation of $500,000 for all three crop years. There's a separate form that you'll need to file in the county office if you meet that 75% qualification. So how do you apply for the WIP Plus program? So you need, first need to contact your administrative county office. So you wanna make sure you're talking to the county office where your farm is administered for the FSA program. And they are going to help you determine your eligibility for the program. So you will file a WIP Plus application. It's called a form FSA 894. We also have to file a notice of loss for the WIP Plus program. So if you did file a notice of loss with your crop insurance agent, we do get a download from RMA through an FSA RMA data sharing database with all of the loss information that you've provided to RMA. If for some reason you didn't provide a, a notice of loss to RMA, but you have crop insurance, you can still file a notice of loss directly on your WIP Plus application. If you're a NAP producer, you're going to file your notice of loss directly on the WIP Plus application and we obtain information from your NAP notice of loss that you may have filed earlier in the year. And if you're an uninsured producer, you will always file your notice of loss on your WIP Plus application. You also need to do an acreage report for FSA 578 for FSA. So when you sign up for the WIP Plus program, you will be asked to provide acceptable, verifiable, and reliable production records. Okay, so we may have already obtained those if you're a NAP producer, or we may have those if you have a federal crop notice of loss, because we do receive that information in the data sharing between FSA and RMA. If you have a production loss on your, on your insured crop, we also get the indemnity information that you've been paid on that crop from RMA directly. So for some reason, you are unable to provide production records the WIP plus payment will be determined based on the lower of the actual loss certified by the producer or the county expected yield and disaster county disaster yield. The county disaster yield is the production that the producer would have been expected to make based on the eligible disaster conditions in the county, and those are set by the county and state committees. One more bit of information before you decide if you wanna apply for WIP Plus. We do require participants that receive WIP Plus applications to have crop insurance for two consecutive years, no later than 2023 at the 6100 buy-up level if you received a WIP Plus payment. Okay, so this is applicable if you are an RMA producer, a NAP producer, or an uninsured producer applying for the program. All participants receiving a WIP Plus payment must meet linkage requirements. That's a requirement in the Disaster Relief Act that was passed by Congress. If for some reason the crop that you apply to, for a WIP Plus application on is no longer eligible for NAP or crop insurance, the producer is going to have to obtain the whole Farm Revenue Protection Program through their federal crop insurance agent. Linkage does apply to each crop type intended use and planting period on the WIP Plus application. So if you're a producer that receives a WIP Plus benefit on your wheat crop, but not on your soybean crop, you're only required to obtain linkage on your wheat crop that you receive WIP benefits on. And with that, we will go ahead and 
get the next speaker. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is going to be Wanda Broughton, and she's going to talk about all the livestock related pro programs. Um, so the WIP milk class, um, the ELAP or Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honey Bees and Farm Raised Fish program, and the Livestock Indemnity program or the WIP program. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, like Miranda said, my name is Wanda Brayton, and I'm a program director here for the Farm Service Agency in North Dakota. Um, I'm going to start out talking today about the WIP plus milk loss program that we have. Um, the WIP plus milk provides the indemnity to eligible dairy operations for milk that was dumped or removed without compensation from the commercial milk market due to a qualifying weather event such as the floods, tornadoes, wildfires in calendar years 2018 or 2019. For eligibility of the program, the producer um, must not have been responsible for the dump milk. Uh, the producer must be in compliance with our conservation compliance provisions of HEL and WC, highly rollable land or wetland, convert or wetland compliance. And the producer must submit an application to FSA no later than the deadline of February 1st, 2020. The eligibility period for wet plus milk begins on the day the milk was dumped and not shipped on that commercial market. It ends on the day that the milk was last dumped or was removed. The payment rate is 75% of the market value of the dumped milk and producers are limited to 30 days per year for both 2018 and 2019. A claim period is the full calendar month period in which the milk was dumped and not commercially marketed. So if a claim period crosses over into the next month, depending on when that milk was or would have been marketed, then a separate application would be required to be filed. So for an example, um, a producer dumped his milk starting on uh, September 20th uh, through and ending on October 5th, and that producer would be required to complete two different applications, one for each month. So the applicants would need to provide um, the number of times per day that cows were milked and the approximate time of the milking when they're filing their applications. Uh, they also need to provide how often the milk is picked up uh, the dates the milk was dumped, so you would need to know your um, all of the dates associated to that. You would need to have that weather event that caused the milk to be dumped, and we'd also need to know that geographic area of the weather event. And again, uh, uh, applicants would need to also provide, sorry about that, how the milk was removed, uh, whether the milk was measured before being dumped, uh, any records of milk removal, uh, photographs of the weather event, those are always very helpful in any kind of uh, disaster uh, event. And then also the average number of cows milked in base period and that claim period. And as I said with this, again, just remember that the applicants must submit uh, their applications by the deadline of February 1st of 2020. All right, so with that, we're gonna move over into our emergency assistance for livestock, honeybees and farm raised fish. Um, um, this program is eligible for those livestock feed losses for ELAP, uh, the grazing loss, um, and also for honeybees. So for ELAP, um, producer or participants they would need to work with their administrative county office and file each of these documents that we have listed. Uh, the notice of loss, they would need to file that within 30 calendar, calendar days of when that loss occurred. And then also the application for payment, um, they need to file that by within 30 days after the end of the applicable calendar years or the deadline of 
for this year would be January 30th of 2020. In order to be eligible for assistance under ELAP, a livestock producer must have provided eligible grazing land during that normal grazing period for the eligible livestock um, and have suffered a loss in the physical county in which that eligible adverse weather occurred. They need to have timely filed an application. And then of course, they need to have an acre report on file for that eligible grazing land. The event must meet all of the three conditions. It must be an extreme weather event, um, abnormal or unexpected weather event, not expected to occur, and damaging weather event that caused the loss. When we're talking about an eligible adverse weather event, this uh, slide right here, that provides you with what those weather events would be, such as the blizzard, eligible winter storms, excessive wind, floods, lightning, tornadoes, or those wildfires on unfederally managed grazing lands. To be considered an eligible livestock, or to be considered eligible livestock, the livestock must meet um, all of the following conditions. So they need to be grazing animals, such as adult and wean non-adult, uh, beef cattle, beefalo, buffalo, bison, dairy cattle, alpacas, deer, elk, emus, goats, um, reindeer or sheep. And they must have, uh, and they must be livestock that would normally have been grazing the eligible grazing land during that normal grazing period. The livestock also must be livestock that are owned, leased, purchased, purchased under contract or had been raised by a contract grower or an eligible livestock producer during the 60 calendar days prior to the beginning date of that eligible adverse weather condition. And the livestock must have been maintained for, commu for commercial use as part of the producer's farming operation on the beginning date of that eligible adverse weather condition. For least Grazing land, the lease eligibility requirements must be met and appropriate documentation must be submitted in support of the lease. Um, the livestock producer should provide us with copies of um, the BLM or uh, forestry service permits, leases, uh, any final bills or invoices that they might have, uh, any state land leases or subleases if, they're, if that's applicable uh, or a uh, written acreage lease or rental agreement. For grazing losses under ELAP, livestock producers must provide verifiable and reliable documentation of either um, the additional livestock feed fed above those normal quantities that was required to maintain the livestock until the additional feed was available. Um, or proof of removing the livestock from the affected pasture. For 2019, the payment rate for all eligible livestock is 90, 98 cents per animal unit per day. And a producer will only be compensated for the number of days at it, that grazing was lost, not to exceed 150 calendar days in a program year of this, for the same livestock. For lot, livestock feed losses, uh, we would that would need to include, uh, or it does include purchased and mechanically harvested feed or feedstuffs that was lost or destroyed due to the eligible loss condition. Uh, eligible feed purchased above those normal quantities required to maintain your eligible livestock. And then additional expenses for transporting additional livestock feed purchases to eligible livestock. Um, such as equipment, rental fees, and snow removal. So for the purchase feed, livestock feed losses, uh, receipts should be considered acceptable and verifiable documentation in order for them to be considered verifiable documentation. They do need to include the date of purchase, the name and the address of the vendor, the type and quantity of feed 
the cost of the fee that was purchased along with the signature of the vendor if not licensed. For the required documentation, it's the county committees. They, they must determine the value of the lost feed from purchased or produced forage or feed stuff other than forage grazing acres. So it's important to remember that participants may not receive both a grazing loss and additional feed purchases above the normal inside that normal grazing period. And for North Dakota, the, uh, the grazing period is April 15th through October 15th. When determining the livestock feed needs, um, the value of the additional cost of purchasing the additional livestock feed above those normal quantities that is required to maintain the livestock shall not exceed the value of the feed needs of the livestock during the eligible adverse weather event. ELAP also covers honeybees. And for honeybees, all honeybee producers, they must file the FSA 578, which is our acreage report, um, by the January 2nd of the calendar year in which that loss occurred or within and within 30 calendar days of the, the colonies of bees are acquired, split, sold, or transported in or out of the county. There are three types of eligible losses for honeybees. We have our honeybee colony losses, our honeybee hive losses, and also the honeybee feed losses. Some of the required documentation for the honeybee colony loss would be proof of beginning inventory, proof of ending inventory immediately after the eligible adverse weather event or that loss condition. Uh, you would need proof of producer uh, following those best management practices for their hives. Any other additional documentation such as the state health certificate that you may have. Um, and then for the honeybee colony losses of leased hives, we need to have um, a written lease or statement from the leaser regarding the lease arrangement. And then just a note under there that only the producer with the risk in the colony can claim the loss. So again, the producers must have risk in the loss. Sum up for ELAP, the payment rates for 2019 for the honeybee colonies is $140, for the honeybee hives, $258, and then that normal mortality rate is at 22%. We're going to move on to the Livestock Indemnity Program, or LIP. And LIP provides benefits to our livestock owners and contract growers for livestock deaths in excess of normal mortality and for injured livestock sold at a reduced price. And if the cause of, and if it was caused by an eligible adverse weather, we would cover eligible disease or attack by animals introduced into the wild or protected by federal government. Livestock owners or contract growers must file both of the following in the county office where that loss occurred. So again, we need to have them file that notice of loss within 30 calendar days of when the loss is first apparent. Uh, alternative methods of filing the notice of loss would include we could accept it by telephone, by fax, or email. And then we would also need to have them file an application for payment within 60 calendar days after the end of the calendar year in which that loss occurred. There are three different loss conditions, uh, the eligible adverse weather event, the eligible disease, and eligible attack. When we're talking about the eligible loss, Conditions, again, the weather event must meet all of the three conditions. Again, the abnormal, uh, unexpected weather event not expected to occur, the extreme weather event or damaging weather event that is directly kills or injures the livestock. We do have a few conditions that are not eligible for LIP. Uh, one is of which is drought, would not be considered an eligible weather event except when it's associated to anthrax. Any loss that is not the direct result of an eligible loss condition would be ineligible along with a loss that is the result of a management decision. A 
A couple more ineligible loss conditions would be where the livestock deaths um, because of insufficient or contaminated water or feed during a drought. And then the confinement operations that do not follow those good management practices or use those operating equipment that meets industry standards. When we're talking about disease, the county committee can approve the notice of loss using disease as eligible adverse weather event, providing all of these following conditions are met as described on the screen here. Um, the first, the livestock death loss is the direct result of the disease. Uh, an eligible adverse weather event um, added to the death of the eligible livestock by disease. And then the disease that is certified or licensed and is in good standing by a veterinarian that the death of the livestock was due to a disease that was caused by an eligible or increased by an eligible adverse weather event. Eligible livestock for LIP, again, would be our adult or non-adult beef cattle, our beefalo, bison, um, buffalo, dairy cattle, elk, alpacas, caribou, deer, emus, equine animals. There's a couple more here um, that are eligible. We look at the goats, the llamas, the poultry, reindeer, sheep, swine. For the eligible livestock, um, the animals must be alive at the time of the eligible loss di disaster. So only those animals that were born and were alive at the time of the loss condition are potentially eligible. Um, and unborn animals are animals that are not born alive, which are aborted or stillborn at the time of the eligible loss condition. Those would not be eligible for livestock under LIP. Some of, the, some of the different terms that we use when we're talking about commercial use for LIP is defined as used in the operation of a business activity engaged in, a, in as a means of livelihood or profit. And then the definition for farming operation for LIP is a business enterprise engaged in producing agricultural commodities. There is some required documentation that needs to be provided so they, if we're talking about um, for death or injury, we must have proof that the death or injury occurred as a direct result of an eligible loss. So the, the producer must provide proof that the livestock death was a direct result of an eligible loss condition. And then also the beginning inventory documentation. So prior to that eligible loss condition, we do need to have some beginning inventory documentation. LIP payment rates. Uh, the payment rates for livestock owners are based on 75% of a fair market value of the livestock as determined by the county committee for the specific livestock type and weight. So for any, for more information on any of our livestock disaster programs, um, please reach out to your local county office. Thank you, Wanda. Our next speaker and final speaker is going to be Brian Haugen, and he's going to talk about on-farm storage loss program. All right, thank you, Miranda. As uh, you'd mentioned, my name is Brian Hogan, Program Director here in our state office on price support. And what I was wanted to discuss with you is the, 2000, the 2019 uh, Disaster Relief Act that uh, brought us WIP Plus also, also authorized a, a new program for us that is called the On Farm Storage Loss Program. As far as what we have for eligibility under this program, it is to provide direct payments to eligible producers for uncompensated losses that uh, 
uh, as a result of their harvested commodity that has been placed in farm storage that due to results of snowstorms or uh, floods resulted in the commodity to be lost. And that would be specific to losses that occurred in calendar years 2018 and 19. Uh, my discussion is specific to losses of the commodity. Um, although we may have structures that were damaged or lost due to snowstorms and floods, this program does not authorize compensation uh, for the structure other than compensation for the commodity itself that was lost. There is a total of 29 commodities uh, that are uh, authorized and eligible under the on-farm storage loss program. Uh, there are, and we've listed uh, the eligible commodities uh, on the slide that we have presented. Uh, there are national payment rates uh, for each commodity that have been established, and we'll show you those uh, here uh, forthcoming. And again, we're talking specific to the commodity that, that is lost, not uh, any compensation for structural damage. So how would eligibility for this program uh, be obtained? Uh, it would be for commodities that have been harvested and they're placed into on-farm storage. And as a result, under normal conditions, the quality of that commodity would have been maintained um, from harvest up until the time it was marketed. However, unfortunately, uh, due to floodwaters from a, a river, a creek that is backed up, uh, caused the uh, commodity to be either damaged uh, or lost. Um, so again, it's commodities harvested, they're in farm storage, they're damaged or lost, it does not cover commodities that are in farms, uh, that are in commercial storage, um, nor does it cover commodities that are damaged or lost uh, due to power outages. The payment calculation for producers that would be applying and eligible under this program, uh, again, as I mentioned, and I'll show you, uh, there are national payment rates uh, that have been established by each eligible commodity. So it would be that payment rate uh, times the quantity, the eligible quantity, the quantity that had been lost, and then those payments are then, that amount is then factored by uh, 75%. The next slide just is an example of some of the commodity payment rates that again, we're using a national rate for all counties, all states, the same rate uh, would apply. And again, it's referenced here as mentioned to that adjustment to that 75% factor. So how would a producer that uh, has losses of commodities due to floodwaters uh, be eligible? You'd contact your local county FSA office and uh, the application that they would assist you in completing is the FSA uh, 272 form. That covers slides on the on-farm storage loss program that we wanted to discuss. The next uh, two slides that we wanted to share with you is of all the programs in which we've talked, uh, in addition to just those, they all programs that we administer through the Farm Service Agency, information is available. Uh, through our staff, the local county offices. So we have a link there to the web address on how you can locate your local county office. And then furthermore, this slide um, identifies, and it mirrors what Lisa talked to you about previously regarding specific counties in North Dakota that have farm loan teams. And that would be indicated by the counties that have the uh, bullet uh, referenced in, in their county uh, design there, that would mirror what Lisa showed you of where our farm loan teams are located throughout North Dakota that would be able to assist you if you, for example, were interested in an emergency loan. Another item that you can stay connected with uh, current programs or ongoing programs through the Farm Service Agency is through our uh, Gov Delivery Network um, to receive emails and text messages on current programs or new programs that uh, would be available where you would be able to text to your, your county office uh, to the FSA now and receive a direct specific program information. And our delivery is going to be specific and limited to just those deadlines or important reminders that uh, you need to uh, maintain to remain compliant with the Farm Service Agency and to ensure that you remain eligible for program benefits. So again, that's through our Gov delivery by texting based on the instructions provided on this slide to FSA now. 
And the last slide we have for you is a summary of all the presentations that we've discussed with you today. Uh, we all began all of them with our contact information and this slide uh, summarizes and identifies once again in one format, all the presentations and the associated contact person for those presentations. Thank you, Brian. So now we'll open it up for to questions and you can either unmute and ask the question or you can type it in the chat box and I'll make sure it gets addressed. Just a reminder that the slides will be posted on the NDSU Extension Egg Disasters webpage under the Programs tab, and I will also, the recording will be posted with that. So both the slides and the recording, because there's a lot of information here, we want you to be able to go back and look at those. Um, so we have a question from Luke to everyone here is, what plus are preventive plant acres included in payment calculation? Hi, this is Christine Knudsen, and for the 2018 year, yes, prevent plant acres are included in the WIP Plus application. However, for 2019, prevent plant acres are not included in the WIP Plus program. Uh, the disaster legislation that was passed by Congress in June included a top-up payment to producers for pre prevent plant acreage. Those payments started going out in October. That is why those payments, those payments have already been issued to those producers for 2019 prevent plant, and that is why they are not included as eligible acres for 2019 WIP Plus. Um, that would only, uh, if you're a NAP person or a, if you have NAP coverage on your crop or you're an uninsured producer, those 2019 prevent plant acres are included in your WIP Plus application, so they're only not included if you are an insured producer for that crop. We have any other questions out there? Well, I'm sure it's a lot of information to take in. Um, so again, the slides and the recording will be on our website and as well as everyone's contact information so you can get a hold of them if you do have a question at, at a later time. But thank you for joining us. And again, reach out to your local FSA office, our extension office if you have any questions at all. And we're here to help you in any way we can. And Miranda, we just wanted to thank you for allowing us this opportunity to present our disaster recovery program. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.